Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the next instalment of the House Faculty Visual Politics Seminar Program for Semester 1 in 2019. Thanks to you all for being here today. I know it's a busy time of semester with grading and so on, and it's late on a Friday afternoon, so we really appreciate you hanging around um, for today's seminar. <coughs> For those of you who don't know me, I'm Emma Hutchison and I'm stepping in today for Professor Roland Bleicher who directs the group. Today, I'm delighted to introduce a speaker who I think very much reflects the interdisciplinarity and cross-disciplinary spirit the visual politics program seeks to embrace and foster here at, in the faculty. Dr. Kirill Shields is a researcher in the Asia Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect here in the School of Political Science and International Studies Kirill is also lecturer in the School of Communication and Arts in the faculty, as well as teaching across ACU and USQ. In addition, Kirill is currently an Auschwitz Jewish Center Fellow, and he is editor of the journal Genocide Studies. Kirill's work is situated across a range of disciplines, including political science, cultural studies, history, and studies of narrative fiction. Among other topics, his work is focused on the challenges of representing and narrating political atrocity and genocide, and in particular, through the traumas of the Holocaust. While his work has done this in the past, examining fiction, such as the writing of Marcus Zusak, Helen demidenko Davo, and James McQueen, in today's paper, he's going to take his work in a new direction, I think, and examine the proliferation of amateur photographs of the Third Reich on social media. So just one more note before I pass over to him, just about the format. As is usual, Kirill will speak for up to around 30 minutes, then we'll open up for Q&A and discussion. Again, as per the usual format, I'd be very happy if we could keep it informal and as productive as possible uh, for Kirill. So with this, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kirill Shields. Thank you, Emma. Um, I, I brought this along. This is actually the manuscript of the book's based on, and Emma saw this and goes, how long are you talking for? I thought, no, no, no fear. But it, it, it may go a little, okay, I'll, I'll get started because I go off on tangents, but I'm hoping that we'll stick to 30 <laughs> minutes. I'm already off on a tangent, right? Okay, so let me start. Um, I'm going to be a little indulgent and talk about me to begin with and a couple of anecdotes to begin. Firstly, thank you very much for having me, Emma, and thank you, Roland, for inviting me to be, to be here. Um, I'm, I'm, thank you for so many people coming from so many different places, from different buildings all over from, yeah, it's great. What's going on? <laughs> I mean, the, everyone's looking at each other like, where are you from? And you work here and that type of thing. Um, but uh, I feel somewhat of a, an intruder in the world of political science, but I'm hoping that some of this cultural studies will end up wearing off on some of you um, political scientists and what have you. Uh, so let me start with a couple of anecdotes just to, as, for context. This is me some years back. Uh, Alex, do you know where that is, by chance? Your old alma mater? <laughs> Ab? No, it's all. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is me about 15 years or so back. I'm about to embark on a trip, uh, if you don't mind, I'm also going to read, um, across Europe. It's going to last about four months, and my mum is about... You know, she's crying, thinks she's never going to see me again at this particular moment. Um, so I started in Hull. I ended up in Mongolia. Um, just before Christmas, so it was a really uncomfortable bike tour. I had very little money. In fact, I had no money except on the road most of the time. Um, and, um, and I had no maps. That was my, you know, that was the thing that was going to drive me. So what happened is I ended up weaving my way all around Europe um, to places, Netherlands, Germany, Czech Republic, Poland, Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, and ended up in, in Russia, and then finally I got to Mongolia. But one thing I noticed as I moved through the small villages and the markets were these, the selling of personal photos in market stalls on Sundays, and people were selling their wares out on the market squares. Um, and not only individual photos, but also photo albums. Um, and there were the odd framed photo as well. And I, I grew quite intrigued, not only by the photos themselves, but why they were selling in such an open place in places where I thought you couldn't display um, SWAT stickers and what have you. Um, with the small amount of money I had, I brought a few and I stored them in one of these penny bags until I got to the Russian border. I crept across the Russian border without knowing it and they pulled me up out to 10 kilometres past the Russian border and accused me of espionage and something and took everything from me. So I ended up with just my clothes in the middle of the snow, my bike was taken and everything, so I lost all of that. Um, but then, of course, some years later, with a little bit more money, um, having you know, come back to Australia and started a PhD, I started collecting them and became more interested in them. 
Um, and I've masked quite a quantity of these photos and I can talk more on where they're going, where I'm donating or who I'm donating to later on. Um, so this leads to the second anecdote. Well, I hope this works. I haven't tried this. Yeah. So um, I mean, about 2011, 2000, 2000, 2012, I started writing for a number of architecture magazines and all my friends in the world of architecture kept saying to me that I need to self-promote. So I think in political science, the way through self-promotion is the Twitter. Uh, so everyone's was in political science, yeah. But back then, in the world of architecture and design, it was, um, it was Instagram. And so um, it got me thinking, I, I opened an Instagram account, but then it also got me thinking about the photos I had in my possession and what I could do with them at that particular time. So thinking I was going to get a great job at Yad Vashem and Holocaust Studies, so I was going to get a thousand followers and what have you, I was going to have everyone really interested in my work, I opened this social media Instagram account called Everyday Images of the Reich. And the idea was I would take a photo, uh, you can see an example, um, I don't know if that's an example, I would uh, decipher what it said on the back, which is actually quite hard at times, I'll come this one here, for example, um, I'd, I'd then translate and I'd give a little bit of a note, um, and then Jenna Bragger, who writes on the visual, I don't know if you come across Jenna Bragger's work, sent me the key to Instagram is hashtag, so I hashtags as much as I possibly could, I mean, I get, I get really impatient, and especially hashtagging something like this. Um, what it led to was a following of six people <laughs> <laughs> over about a year or so. One of them was my mother, one of them was my partner, who, who hates this type of stuff and felt sorry for me anyway. Um, and, and so it was, it was actually quite a failure. I'm, I'm actually surprised it's still up there. It seems like I can't get rid of it now, um, but it's there. But one thing I noticed um, as part of this and were some of the really odd comments that kept cropping up in, in, in association with these photos. Um, and some of them were really quite hard to interpret. I've actually edited them off this because um, some of them were anti-Semitic and in fact Instagram edited them, some of them off them, themsel themselves. So for example, I, I think in this one here, one interested onlooker wrote um, this one here, RIP in inverted commas. And then hashtag, hashtag Uber Alice beside it. And I wasn't really sure how I was going to interpret that. But then what I did discover, and it was f way less ambiguous, were a really a, an ongoing influx of racist and anti-Semitic comments posted below these images. So it got me thinking about the ways photos are uploaded um, and these particular types of photos. And not only creating, you know, that were obviously anti-Semitic, but also perpetuating a certain mythology. The comments that sort of led to the idea that the golden era of German history was under Hitler's Reich. Um, so not only comments that said, oh, I wish we'd lived back in the day, that type of thing, but all hail Adolf Hitler, the SS were the best, because there were a couple of photos of SS amongst all this as well. Strong men, weren't they brave, and so on and so forth. Um, and so in the process of doing this, it led me to this particular manuscript, which I've called the Zeitgeist of Atrocity, Zeitgeist in, um, suggesting that you know, during the, the period itself, there was a, a spirit of the times that encouraged atrocity, that perpetuated atrocity, that allowed atrocity to, to be promoted and become normalised. And thinking that maybe in this day and age, through the use of something on social media like Instagram, a similar thing is sort of occurring. We may not have the atrocity um, carrying, being carried out, and particularly it may not be as blatantly obvious, but maybe we're sort of slowly leading to that. So I've basically summed up my whole talk in about uh, five minutes. Um, uh, okay. Good, we're done. <laughs> uh, the, so this is how the, the, what the manuscript looks like. You can see with an uh, introduction where I start again with an anecdote. We've got the Nazi and the history of the Nazi image. Chapter 2 is um, on reading the amateur photos then, as they were meant to be read by those who took the photos. Chapter 3 is reading the images now, including aspects such as the Holocaust and how we take that into consideration. And then chapter four, social media. This recent thing, which is colouring is um, colouring is images to give them contemporary value. Hashtag social media t tools and then this reoccurring sort of questioning: Is the zeitgeist of atrocity occurring again? And then um, there's the conclusion. And so this talk is based on this um, um, book. I'm not alone. There are a couple of other people who've written on this in the past. I put some of these up here just in case you're interested. This one by Janina Struck is really interesting because she maps out the way photos over time have been re reused to in places like museums out of context from their original setting um, and the way it's highly politicised. 
So, for example, uh, once upon a time, there was a preference to use only American and British photos when it came to curatorial processes because they were seen to be more authentic. But in this day and age, it's more likely the Soviet images because they were the ones of Auschwitz. And Auschwitz has more currency when it comes to putting a, a, a curatorial um, um, display together. This one over here is by the Australian, um, the Australian um, academic, Frances Gruen, and she talks on the um, Eva Braun and all number of things, including um, some of the images from the uh, Warsaw and Woods ghettos. But along the way, I also came across some really odd books that also talk on amateur photos. And this one up here is a, a book called Cross-Dressing in the Wehrmacht. Uh, it's all photos of soldiers cross-dressing, uh, mostly army soldiers, not so much the Luftwaffe or the, or the, or the, or the Navy. Um, so he's fascinated in talking about why, why was this a phenomenon and of course war was on and maybe they, they enjoyed it for whatever sort of social purpose but um, it's, it, it, there are a lot of photos of Germans cross-dressing during the period. This one here is a little bit odder, this one's called Shit and it's a, it's a photo um, book based purely on photos of, amateur, of Germans shitting during the war. And for some strange reason, as I've, over the many years I've been collecting these things, these, they were really fascinated with people shitting. There's a lot of these. And they're actually quite gross. Um, some of them are really quite graphic. Uh, we can talk on a whole lot of different <laughs> aspects when it comes to this kind of thing. And then this one here... Um, Nikki said, if the talk gets really boring, you should take this book in, Kirill, because it's called Private Pornography of the Third Reich. And it's all about, well, pornography was actually banned, but there are sort of some pornographic images being distributed. There's not much of a book. But Nikki said, well, if anyone picks this up during your talk, you know you've gone really badly. So I'll put this in the middle <laughs> of the room for anyone to look at later. Um, yeah, so that's sort of a brief introduction to the, to the topic. But I thought I'd talk now just on Adolf Hitler. Um, uh, and the advent of, of, of the importance of, of photography to, to the Third Reich. So here he is, you know that guest, um, uh, you, sorry, I'll start again. Hitler understood the power of the photo and throughout his career he employed his personal photographer, a guy called Heinrich Hoffmann, and then later Hoffmann's company as well, to take most of the images we have of him. Um, and that's why we always see Hitler from a position of power in poses from like 1920 onwards that establish him and then of course in the 30s and 40s that perpetuate myths and the reverence attached to him, establish him as the Fuhrer. Um, and there are some exceptions to this particular type of photo. These types of photos that were meant to have been destroyed, that never were. So this is Heil, Heil, Sigli, Heil, Hitler. He hated these type of photos, um, but Heinrich Hoffmann hid them and when Allied soldiers came to the studio they found them and now they're on the, this open access to everyone. Um, but of course, Hitler, of course, wasn't alone in realising the power of the photo, so too Joseph Goebbels, so too would see more manner of departments that made up the Third Reich bureaucracy, and included those who employed um, the photojournalists of the period, those who, who dictated what artists could take photos of, what they prefer shot, and then there were people who made the collector's cards, the cigarette cards, the official postcards, certain bits of tourism, and so on and so forth. And then there are also the official photographic departments attached to various um, locations. In, the police had a photographic department. The, Scarpa, the Gestapo had many. Um, and also the camps had their own photographic departments. Auschwitz had two um, photographic departments. Um, and so, yeah, so this enabled the proliferation of all manner of professional photographer. Male and female alike, there was equality amongst the, in the profession. And they sent the photojournalists all out th throughout all the world. But far more prolific were amateur photos, and by this I mean photos developed in small shops throughout Europe, um, and on one or two occasions maybe the phot photographers developed them themselves, depending on how dedicated they were to the hobby. And these images show like, relatively mundane scenes such as families and friends at picnics, street parades, holiday snaps, swimming, relaxing, sometimes bathing, sometimes shitting, smoke from smoldering building, comrades in arms, that type of thing. And they're black and white, mostly black and white, or they've kind of got a, a brownish tinge to them, and they're mostly small. And 90% of these, if not 99% of them, were state-sanctioned, state-encouraged, sometimes state-sponsored through various prizes and awards, and very much state-manipulated. Because the Nazis, with Joseph Goebbels at the fore, realised the potential of the amateur photographer, and they went to really great lengths to encourage photography that promoted their version of Germany. Um, and this version, at its core, was... Um, Germany to be a nation that was of well-being, it was built on comradeship and good health, it was optimistic, it was superior to others, 
Um, and so to the, it, it believed in the goodness of the Germanic lifestyle. It pointed its lens at family life. It loved certain types of landscapes, cultural practice, and so on and so forth. Um, and there's just sort of one example. So when I first began exploring these types of images, I didn't time anything. Sorry, can I just get a check on that? Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. When I first began exploring some of the images, what I was the belief, I thought there'd be just maybe a few thousand. Back in the 1980s, 1990s, the estimations were that there were maybe 10,000, maybe stretching to 100,000 at most. But since then, academics have um, reconfigured um, this figure to the point now we realise that the only time in history that has seen an equivalent proliferation in imagery is now, where we have the iPhone and social media. And I think, uh, are you Sebastian? Mm -hmm. Did you say something in your visual politics chapter? I think you mentioned something about 95 million images a day are uploaded or something like that. Like it's I can't remember the exact figure, but it's crazy. It is crazy, yeah. So yeah, the Germans weren't doing quite that amount, but they were doing mm -hmm. close to it. Um, and this kind of seems so. The estimates now are the hundreds of millions of, photo, of photos and millions of photo albums, and the Bundesarchives actually has a, a huge number of these, and I can talk on this a little bit more later. Um, and while it seems hyperbolic, it makes sense if you think through um, the camera during the 30s and 40s, especially the camera in Europe. Um, let me just give you a really brief overview of facts and figures. For first thing, in 1940, Germany had a population of 71 million. Um, I won't go into, actually, I won't go into the history of the camera due to um, time restraints. But um, by, by in, at the same time in 1940, Due to the fact that the cameras were state-sponsored and also the outbreak of war and, and the cameras were given to soldiers, the estimations were that at least half the population had an amateur ca camera. That means the subsidies were given to them. So you can see why there's such a huge proliferation of photos. Um, and that's just an example of one there. So this is um, Goebbels uh, in uh, the amateur photo... A magazine called Photofront, talking about how essential it was for the Germans to take part in this amateur photography. Um, uh, alongside that, I'll leave that up there, alongside that, Goebbels called his, the German people his army of millions of amateur photographers. And uh, according to Alida Asman, she says that the project of the National Social State was to transform, as far as possible, external propaganda into personal practice, choice and habit. Um, and together with the mass distribution of new private cameras, a visual regime was constructed and implanted in the minds of citizens who then collectively practiced, shared, quoted, um, and consolidated the iconic photos of the national um, social estate themselves, suggesting that it was in fact the amateur photographer that held, held more weight than the professional photographers of the day. And that's the, that's the, and then this guy here, Ralph Saxon, says that, just to sum up, the power of the state rested not so much on the contribution of the grand visual images provided by professionals, so on, as on the simple practice of shooting photos by anybody who could hold the camera in his or her hand. So, that was part one. Let's quickly go on. Here are some examples. Um, uh, I'll just put these up. Um, because they contain, of course, not only the banal, but in amongst the most, uh, atrocity as well, but I'll talk a little bit more. The second. That's an amateur photographer, a photo photograph of a, a ghetto. And this one I thought was interesting. These are Jews that have been rounded up, made to work a, a, in an in a airfield in the eastern Poland. And you can see in the background that one of the soldiers there has a camera in hand taking photos as well, alongside his, his comrade. Um, that's just a little thing on it. So, to social media, second part. Sorry. A little bit. Um, what I now wish to do is to talk uh, on social media, specifically the social media site Instagram, because Instagram, I don't, I'm, 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 I don't have any other sort of social media for one reason, I don't have Facebook or anything. And there's a whole uh, language associated with the site that's more semantic, including hashtag commentary and the likes. And just as an introduction here, I thought I've given you a, a very short list of Instagram sites with their numbers as fo and followers from Christmas last year, they um, post these types of photos. And this is just a sample. So they grow and they also are deleted and so on and so forth. And their followers grow and they also reduce. Um, and the types of photos that are uploaded are something like this here. This is uh, a more professional shot, but this is also, I put this up because someone's also colored it. 
And the odd thing about colouring is that, and it's really problematic again, is the fact that when people colour, of course, they most, not in this case, but mostly they colour all their eyes blue and so on and so forth. So you have this sort of Aryan um, stereotype being perpetuated through the colouring process. But what this combination en enables, so a combination of photos taken by Nazis in the 30s and 40s and then coloured and then uploaded, is a consideration of one epoch's identity given relevance some 80 or 90 years later. And by contemporising, sort of questions form around how the original embedded propaganda may have lessened with time and education. You would think it's actually, because we know something about the Holocaust, then the propaganda embedded won't be as powerful as it once was. Um, and so the question is, well, are these sort of sites propagating what we would call in this day and age hate speech? Um, uh, Bernard Huff, Huff, so Huff suggests that... Um, an assumed correspondence between Nazi ideology and the images perceived by common soldiers is an mis uh, misleading oversimplification. Moreover, it is predicated on an identity specific to the time and therefore makes a great deal of the problem disappear because the threat would thus cease to exist with the end of the perverse ideology. In summary, what he's saying there, the, the, the threat remains. That very ideology, once embedded, is the same as we see in this day and age. And our reading of these images is problematic today as once they might have been in the 30s and 40s. And so therefore, what role do amateur images such as these play in contemporary society and contemporary politics? And are these images adding to current social and political trends fomented in part by social media? Because even while amateur photos of the right remain mostly black and white and grainy and badly taken, um, they do offer the contemporary viewer an opportunity to idealise the period, to go back and do the very things that they intended to do, which is to you know, create a promote a wholesome community and so on and so forth. And so I come back to the title of the talk, which is, are these sites rebuilding a zeitgeist of atrocity? And what happens when old photos are given a new lease of life through colour and so on and so forth? As another example... This site is called uh, Third Reich History. You can sort of see the colouring process in place here. Some of these are amateur and some of these are also professional, taken from various places. Um, but some of these posts uh, are met with, and I'm only going to provide a sample of some of the comments, in inverted commas, things like, great hero, great man, rows of emoticons of German flags, true hero, Awesome men, men of honor, men of honor, and there are some that come out and say fascist pig and what have you, but they're actually in the minority. Um, most of them are uh, perpetuated the things. We get combat groups described as infamous, hardened, and the reverence is given to those highly decorated soldiers. So the more highly decorated, the more famous, the more people seem to like it, which is a problematic way of how do you, what, what does the like mean? And two photos that include Jews showing the subordinates, so there are some photos on here that do show subordinate Jews in there, uh, garner many likes from many followers, sort of questioning the intentions of what, this, what does liking mean. When you like a photo of someone, of a German subordinating a Jew, what is it you're liking? You're liking the photo or you're liking the political content? Um, so what I'm left feeling after you look at a number of these sites, and this is not me, but this is the general public, I suspect, is a feeling of admiration for a large corpus of German men who um, who fought excuse me, uh, for Germany, who were rugged and handsome, and whose credentials are not easily replicated. So we come across a really problematic situation. So the problem, therefore, is not simply one of individual postings that contribute to sort of hate fuel websites. Um, and the, there are those on Stormfront, but a collective feel that emanates from these sites. Along with that, um, Adam Klein in, in notes in his study of online hate speech that what we are doing in this day and age is being able to create communities very, very easily through hashtags and through likes and through um, um, uh, also through the click of a mouse. And this often negates sort of ethical considerations. So um, excluding the Holocaust, for example, we don't take the Holocaust on board and instead we promote a certain um, uh, history and in doing so, we contemporise. So that's the gist of the argument. Um, are we going for time there? Good. We've got 10 minutes to go. <clears throat> in composing this, though, so we've got, we've got amateur photos from then put up on social media sites now, but there was a whole lot of things that I came across that I, I thought were really interesting. Um, so I want to just touch on a couple of those things that complicate this reading, because it wasn't quite as simple as me just saying, oh, I'll put this down on paper. Um, anybody who's come across Roland Barthes or Susan Sontag and the rest of the likes of it, you come across uh, notions of falsely placed empathy. Um, so I'm just going to touch on a, a number of these things that complicate this reading. Um, uh, for one, 
Um, once upon a time, photos and albums are used to memorise and to remember, but in this day and age, by contrast, we have the act of photography is thought to be far more superficial, um, to the extent that, um, and I quote, recent research by anthropologists, sociologists and psychologists seems to suggest that the increased employment of digital cameras favours the functions of communication and identity formation at the expense of uh, um, photography's use as a tool of remembering. So we're not using it as we once did to remember our forebears, we're using it in this day and age to create our own identity. And it gives us, so not only are we, not only is the practice of taking photos, but also the practice of looking at photos has departed from traditional practice. In this day and age, we glean brief glimpses of an image at really at a furious rate, and yet, at the same time, we're creating communities far quicker than we once would have had via likes and hashtags. So then the question is, well, what then of contemplation? What then of sentimentality? How do we foster these things? How do we look back and actually um, pay um, homage to this past? So then the second thing that complicated this is the way narratives of history are formed via traditional photographic practices. Um, so. Um, in the, Insta in the Insta Instagram account um, in the, that I showed you before, the past is obviously present, the past is there, but the question is then, what does that tell us about the past, or are we, is it telling us more about the person who's posting it and their ideals and their interests than it does about German history? Um, and whose identity is it therefore informing? And all those people who are also associated with it, is it their identity we're reading into, or is it the actual um, the history that's... The, the, um, the, the imagery itself. And Don Slater claims um, that instead of gluing photos into albums and therefore into history, in this day and age, we pin and blue tack them haphazardly onto surfaces and therefore into the moment, into the display and self presentation of the present. And this idea then leads to a third consideration put up by Marianne Hirsch and Leo Spitzer, who argue that um, Holocaust photos and these particular images, if you want it, the very fact that they're called Holocaust photos is, is a complication as well. And I quote, they tell us more about what we want and need from the past than about the past itself. Um, to go on just quickly in the last couple of minutes, the last two things to pick up on. Um, I quote, this is sorry, I'm going to go ahead. I won't talk on that. I'll talk on the way we read certain photos. We've still got about seven minutes. Oh, good. Okay. I'm panicked by it. I'm really scared by it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go for like 50 <laughs> minutes. Yeah. I was like, no, 30 minutes. That's it. You can't go on. <laughs> I'm not rolling. <laughs> oh, good. Um, I'm going to quote by, oh, sorry, we come across this quote here. Victor Bergen, um, who says that uh, with most photographs, decoding and vestiture take place instantaneously, unselfconsciously, naturally, but it does take place. The wholeness, coherence, identity which, which we attribute to the scenes of projection, a refusal of, of an impoverished reality in favour of an imaginary plenitude. And hence we come to questions here now of authenticity and subjectivity of intended, reading, um, intended reading, readings versus considered reflection. Um, and this we see time and time again. If you ever sat down on, on a Sunday afternoon with a beer in hand and watch SBS's um, documentaries on Germans and Nazis, the images they use are always the same things over and over, replicated over and over again. Um, so imagery in that case is taken out of context and using ma or not, ma not so much imaginatively, unimaginatively, because there's heaps more sources they could have used. But it talks to them about where the reality of it versus the imagined, or at least the reality versus um, the way a director or a production company wishes to use these types of things. And then I just finally make a fifth point, and I'm really talking very quickly on really quite um, complex issues, is Roland Barr and his commentary on the punctum. So the punctum of the photo, according to Bart, as everyone would know who works in visual politics, is that the thing that jumps out and he says, I think it pierces you, um, it arrests your eye. So Marianne Hirsch and Leo Spitzer talk about once upon a time, Jews in various cities in Eastern Europe took, took a walk on a Sunday afternoon and had their photo taken. You could then buy that particular photo and take it home. But after 1941, what they were doing, they were still walking down the street, but instead they were having, a, uh, you find the uh, gold star on the lapel of their jackets or on their um, coats. And that thing that arrests your eye is that gold star, because it completely reconfigures your reading of that particular image. Um, so this was the punctum, and that's, that was their example of it. 
And this punctum is based on knowledge of an event, that you have to know something about it. Maybe it's based on ethical or moral composition of the individual to make sense of that punctum. Um, and I'll just put a, a couple of the examples up here. So this one's not my, from, that's from the Wiener Library, and this is from the collection I have here. Um, so I put up these just as a means of consideration. I'm not going to give any context to them and ask a couple of questions. So are these two photos photos of atrocity or are these photos of uh, just of the everyday, of the vernacular and the banal? Is there anything interesting about them? Secondly, um, should we read the Holocaust into these? Because if we do, it completely alters our way of reading them. Or should we just read them at face value as per you know, the person who took the photo, the perpetrator who took the photo? Um, and then once you add context, does it actually make these photos more interesting? If you know nothing about them, they look really quite boring, but if I was to tell you what they were of, would your interest be piqued? And then the, does that alter your reading of them? And does that make you want to look at them even more? And what is that weird macabre curiosity that goes on? Um, and then the question is, so where's the punctum in all this? Where's that moment that sits out and jumps and hits you in the eye or pierces you? Um, and in fact, it's the context, it's the thing that sits out of the out, uh, out, outside of frame that's the punctum. It's our imagination that brings the punctum to the photo and sort of readdresses what Roland Barthes' assessment of the photo is. Um, and then caught up in that, of course, is that Susan Sontag said if we see too many photos, we are anaesthetised. If we see too many photos of atrocity, in this case, we're probably anaesthetised because they're really quite dull. But if I was telling you the history of them, um, uh, would uh, it, it would enliven their reading. But at the same time, over time, would that knowing that uh, um, if you saw too many of these, would you eventually get completely bored by them? Um, and so I think there was more commentary on what we could do with these photos. Some people suggest that we destroy them. Some people we've given the, they equate them to medical experiments, not to be seen, but they, we know they're there. Um, and so, but I'll leave it with that, and maybe we'll have questions from here on in.